Children with autism display great heterogeneity in language ability. Some go on to have fluent conversational language, while others don't learn to talk. The brain bases for these very striking differences uh, remain largely a mystery. This video clip shows an example of one child that is really struggling to learn language, even though he's already three years old. What we want to know in our study was whether by activating language regions in the brain at really, really early ages when a child is first diagnosed, would we be able to see the neural substrates that precede and underlie the development of good language versus the development of poor language? 103 toddlers participated, 60 with an autism spectrum disorder, and 43 that were TD or DD. We got our children in in a really interesting way. Um, I created a pediatrician network in San Diego and taught them all to administer a broadband screen, the CSBS, at all well baby checkups between the ages of one and two years. Any baby that fails the screen comes to our center for a full developmental evaluation, and those that are looking like they're at risk participate in biological studies, such as receiving a brain scan. So what we did in this particular study is when children first came in, they got a battery of tests, including the Mullen scales of early learning, which has both a receptive and an expressive subscale, and they received their brain scan at the first time they came in, which was between 12 and 28 months. However, children also got their language battery when they were three to four years of age. And so what we did was we subgrouped children based on their language outcome. Children who had really good language scores were defined as having a T-score of 40 or above on either the receptive or expressive subscales of the Mullen, whereas children with ASD who had poor language were those that had below 40 on both receptive and expressive subscales on the Mullen. So we subdivided the ASD kids into different groups, but we looked back at the brain scan collected when they first came into the study. We created a brief clip to show you how we do our natural sleep imaging procedure here at our autism center at the University of California, San Diego. Protective headphones are placed in the baby and pre-recorded excerpts from stories presented. It's time for bed, little goose, little goose. The stars are out and on the loose. Whole brain activation maps were modeled using the general linear model function SPM8. For our region of interest analysis, we use independently defined regions based on the Neurosynth map, which illustrates regions that are active in response to the feature language across over 700 studies. So the main results of our study are illustrated in figure two. In uh, typically developing children, activation uh, is robust in temp superior temporal cortex, both in the right and left side. You can see activation in the LDDDs, also uh, robust in left language regions, classic language regions. And then most importantly, you can see in the infants and toddlers with ASD who end up with a good later language outcome, have very strong, very robust activation in response to language. But the fourth group, the infants and toddlers um, who end up with a poor language outcome do not have very much activation. They're hypoactivated in superior temporal cortex. These results show that um, activation patterns in autism, even at the very first time of detection of risk for autism are already different between those who will have a better outcome and those who have a poorer outcome. It shows that these different neural qualities, these different neural functions precede and underlie the different trajectories for language development and autism. We next asked the question of whether there were large-scale relationships between neural systems' response to speech and variability across early language development. To highlight these large-scale patterns of brain behavior relationships, we used a method called partial least squares correlation analysis, or PLS. PLS was able to discover two large-scale neural systems, highlighted in hot and cool colors in figures 4, C, and D, whereby response to speech was associated with language-related behavioral variability at both the intake and outcome assessment time points. The pattern of correlation across groups was one of gradient descent, whereby the typically developing and ASD poor subgroup were at opposite poles and showed reversals in the directionality of brain behavior relationships. Our findings highlight the biological differences between those with autism who have a good language outcome versus those with a poor language outcome. 
and raise the questions of what are the differences in etiology uh, behind those that have a good outcome and those a poor outcome? What are the differences in genetic and molecular and cellular uh, systems that are affected in these two? We suspect that they are very likely to be quite different from each other, perhaps so strikingly different that if we better understood those bases, we might be able to develop, as time goes on, treatments that are more uh, precisely tailored to and more successful in benefiting each subtype of autism, those with one neural subtype and those with the other, those that will do better and those that are struggling with language.